Welcome everyone to this uh, info session that we are happy to share with you. Uh, my name is Kareem Jaffer. I'm the Public Events Coordinator for the RASC Montreal Centre. And with me today we have one of our Jack Space Club exec, Evelyn Liu, who's going to be delivering the presentation with the what, the why, and the how of the total solar eclipse. We have Nadir Dao, who's our outreach member for the uh, Board of Directors for the RASC Montreal Centre. And we have our Honorary President David Levy joining us from way down in Arizona. Now, we always start our events here at the Rask Montreal Centre with a land and a sky acknowledgement, because not only are we on the traditional and unceded Indigenous lands of both the Kanahaki as well as the Anishinaabe uh, peoples, we are also sharing the skies with peoples from all over the world. And we can identify that often with looking at the lunar cycle. And we are just at the last quarter of this first spring full moon or the maple moon, uh, maple syrup moon, as we see the maple sugar coming out in our uh, local markets and the Cree of the Great Lakes tend to refer to this as the eagle moon, seeing the majestic bird returning to our skies. And of course, with the eclipse stories that we share with the First Nations and we see their observations of the eclipse, but more on that in a few moments. For now, I'm going to call on our Honorary President David Levy to start us off with a literary reference as we start most of our public events with. So, David, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's wonderful, wonderful to be here at this special eclipse session. And uh, right now, of course, none of us know if we're going to see the eclipse. But uh, I wanted to just tell us, share with you a little bit about my own life of um, eclipsing. My first eclipse was on October 2nd, 1959, with my mom and my younger brother, Jerry. My first total was in 1963. <clears throat> and I knew then all about the um, rules about wearing eclipse glasses and that you needed them at all times except during totality. Anyway, my dad missed the totality part. But uh, so I had the glasses on and... Uh, there's clouds racing to cover the sun, and uh, we're sort of hoping that I'm going to get a break in the clouds to see the total phase. And uh, and I did. And as soon as the um, we were under the moon shadow, off came the glasses, and I saw the corona. My dad had an absolute fit. He looked at me, he said, "David, put your glasses back on." He screamed at me. So I won't can argue with dad during a minute of totality. So I put my glasses back on and then turned in the other direction away from dad, took the glasses back on and I enjoyed the rest of the uh, totality without the glasses and put them on after totality ended. But then the clouds came and we didn't see anything of the totality of the post-totality event events. But anyway, <clears throat> I like to imagine that I spoke to mom and dad afterwards and said, mom and dad, I love you very much. I intend to take care of my eyes so that I will be able to look upon you for many, many decades into the future. I have been wearing the glasses and I can tell you that I know that during totality, you're supposed to take your glasses off. And mom and dad said, you know that? And I said, yes. And dad said, I'm so sorry. Dad said, I'm so sorry, but, uh, but that was fun that we saw that event together. For my quotation today, I would like to read from Shakespeare. And it is just amazing how if Shakespeare was interested in so many things, including eclipses. I know he had a lot of nice things to say about eclipses of the moon, not so much about eclipses of the sun, but there is something very important from Macbeth. And I'm going to quote that to you right now. And it's right after uh, Duncan has been killed by Macbeth himself. And it is, um, it is time for everyone to start talking amongst themselves to see what happened. And one person looks up and he says these words. By the clock, tis day. And yet dark night strangles the traveling lamp. Is it the night's predominance or the day's shame that darkness does the face of earth and tomb when living light should kiss it? 
Thank you all very much, Kareem, and back to you. Thank you so much, David. That was wonderful. And it's it's always a pleasure to have you join our public events. Uh, it's nice when we're either on Zoom or when we're doing it co-modally to be able to have you as here with us. Almost as if you're here in person, but we'll get to that hopefully in the fall. We'll find a time or yeah. around the Adirondack time. Yeah, it'll be, I'll be, it'll be in um, late July. I shall be in Montreal. Excellent. Excellent. So now I'm going to ask our outreach coordinator, Nadir Dow, to uh, talk a little bit about what the RESC is. I'm trying to find my how to unmute myself, but I think I'm just going to use my space bar. <laughs> There it is. Okay. Uh, well, uh, my name is Nader Dow. I This is my first year as an uh, exec on the uh, Montreal Centre, uh, taking care of uh, outreach with the uh, amazing help and assistance and mentorship of Kareem. Uh, uh, initially, um, the Royal Astronomical Society has always been a beacon of astronomical enthusiasm and exploration since its root uh, when it was founded in 1866, 1868. Uh, it stands as, as a, uh, a leading astronomy organization in Canada with over 4,000 members. And uh, it encompasses members from uh, amateur to educators to professionals alike. Uh, being the largest and most active astronomy group in Canada, uh, the vision of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada is to inspire curiosity for all Canadians about the universe, to share scientific knowledge, and to foster collaboration in astronomical pursuits. Our mission is to encourage and to improve the understanding of astronomy for all people at all levels, through education, through outreach programs, through research and publication, and through partnership with uh, uh, the community. And of course, the most important thing about astronomy and astronomy enthusiasts is to just enjoy the night sky uh, as it is. Uh, the Montreal Centre uh, is a, um, as, as well, continuously evolving and it evolved uh, since its establishment in 1918 to become a hub of amateur astronomers to enthusiasts and to professionals alike. Uh, being in the um, cultural tapestry of the island of Montreal, it's a dynamic centre, offers a diverse uh, uh, programs and events and resources designed to inspire curiosity and ignite passion uh, uh, with people of all ages. At the center, we are also a vibrant uh, little community with biweekly events, uh, uh, sometimes in the summer uh, around the Bellevue Observatory uh, at, uh, that has a 14 inch uh, meat telescope. Uh, sometimes it's in Woolly Woods, which is a dark sky southwest of Montreal uh, with its 16-inch light bucket. We have observation nights, we have workshops, uh, we have clubhouses and um, amazing events at the library, Williamson's Library at the John Abbott College. Uh, and from time to time, there are telescope rentals and swap table where people just come and, and swap their, their uh, equipments with other members. And uh, our newsletter, Skyward, uh, also it's always filled with uh, beautiful research and, and the pictures and astro, astrophotography, um, as well as um, a lot of information from members and non-members alike. Uh, as for the uh, monthly public events and talks and star parties, um, I think I will uh, leave it to Karim to just go over the upcoming events, or should, you, should I just do them myself? Oh, I can uh, take care of them, don't worry. All right. Wonderful. Uh, and I just wanna end up with, with the our uh, URL, which is rustmontreal.org, where you can, anybody who is not already a member can just go there, have a look and uh, join us and register and be part of our family. Thank you, Nadir. And yeah, so for our upcoming events, uh, our members events, we have a library night uh, towards the end of April on Wednesday, April 24th. And we will have continue to have clubhouse nights in on Zoom and then in person once the weather starts to get better, which it looks like it's just around the corner. Our next outreach events, uh, Nadir is actually uh, leading an outreach event to Beaconsfield Library with uh, Nicole Laporte, who's our members liaison, and that's on Saturday, April 6th. In Westmount on Eclipse Day, we have our 
outreach team members who are now undergraduate students at Concordia who are going to be delivering a talk and sharing the eclipse with uh, the Westmount community at Victoria Hall. And Nadir is also going to be calling in early on in the day uh, before the partial phases of the eclipse begin to the Priory School to deliver a bit of outreach there. We try our best uh, whenever we can fit in these outreach events for something as momentous as the total solar eclipse to do so. For the actual total solar eclipse, we will have our main event at John Abbott College Oval and then our satellite support at Vanier and at Westmount. And when you observe wherever you observe from, the key is safety and understanding what it is you're seeing. And that's what tonight is all about. So we're going to be sharing with you a little bit of the knowledge that we can share about what the eclipse is and how to safely view it. As far as we want to get across, and we're going to keep hammering this home, is if you have a chance to reach the totality band, you want to do so. And that totality band is the area where you can actually see the moon completely cover the sun. That does stretch through Montreal. We are just at the upper limit of that band. Toronto misses it, but Niagara and Hamilton are right in the heart of the band. So from Ontario all the way out to Newfoundland, we have opportunities to be able to observe this eclipse. And for Quebec, at eclipsequebec.ca, there are actually a list of activities available uh, for observing within a community of individuals getting together to observe. And you can see that, you know, in the Montreal area, there's only a few that are currently set up, but there's a lot through that heart of the totality band region. Now, when we spoke earlier about recognizing that we share the night sky with the ancient cultures and the indigenous cultures of the world that includes phenomena that have been observed over eons we have legends and tales of the solar eclipse that tell us that there's an understanding of the short duration of the eclipse and also the synchronization between lunar and solar eclipses so for the vikings they had the two offspring of loki which were Hadi and Skull, and they chased after the sun and the moon. But if they ever caught the sun, the sun was too hot for them to keep in their mouth. And once they spilled the sun out, they went chasing after the moon to cool off their, their mouths because in their eyes, the cool light of nighttime was colder and the hot night of daytime was, was warmer. In Hinduism, it was the demon god, the demon Rahu. And what the story was, was that both the moon and the sun gods were being given immortality by Vishnu. And so there was an entire feast and the nectar of immortality was to be drunk by both the sun god and the moon god so that they could be with the earth for all time. Now Rahu was very jealous and really wanted to have this nectar of immortality so he snuck into the banquet. And when the sun god and the moon god saw that he had snuck in they went and told Vishnu. So Vishnu branded his axe and beheaded Rahu but before he could Rahu had started drinking from the elixir. So Rahu is now this immortal demon head that floats around chasing after the sun god and the moon god that denied him his full immortality. But the minute he manages to capture one and swallow it because he's only a head, the object comes straight back out. So these observations of the shortness of the disappearing of the moon into the earth's shadow or the moon's shadow falling on the earth and blocking out the sunlight is captured into these stories. The Egyptians would capture the shape of the rising solar eclipse at sunrise or sunset where the sun gets distorted by the horizon and it gave them the imagery of the solar bark of Ra, which is one of the things that uh, Robin Edgar spoke about in our March public event. And then there's a lot of different uh, imagery and petroglyphs of both the falcon uh, eyes as well as the solar bull, the, the shape of the horns on the bull or the cow. In 2021, I had an opportunity with Discover the Universe to work with Lori Rousseau Nepton, who was our guest last year at one of our public events. And she put together some of the Innu uh, stories of the solar eclipse. And these are available on YouTube if you want to read a little bit about some of the First Nation stories here in Canada. One of the big things to recognize is that the aim wasn't just to tell legends and make up stories, it was specifically to capture observations in a way where they could be recorded and sent down after generation after generation. Because predicting and documenting eclipses gave a certain amount of power to an understanding of what was happening in the sky. There's a story from uh, ancient China of Ho and He who were 
court astronomers or astrologers at the time uh, who would try to identify the location of stars and they didn't get the moment of an eclipse correct and as a result they made the king at the time look like a fool so he beheaded them right on the spot the observations and identifying the credit of of how often these different eclipses occur was limited also by the movement of the different astronomers where they were typically in one area of the world all the time which is why it's amazing that the sero cycle was able to be determined by the babylonian astronomers who identified that both the solar and lunar cycles happened together and they happen typically within the same eclipse season when the alignment of the orbits line up, which you'll see shortly. But they identified that there were 18 years, 11 days, and 8 hours between every alignment of the same type. And so if we actually look at this and observe it over time on the globe of the Earth, you can see the same shape of an eclipse path in 1937, in 1955, in 1973, 1991, 2009, all the way out to a forecasted path in 2081 that only differ by 120 degrees in rotation around the globe because it's eight hours of the day within the solar, within the Sero cycle, which is just one third of a day. And as such, we can actually look back at the current eclipse that we are seeing coming through on Monday and recognize that three cycles ago, 18 times three, 54 years ago, you had a similar shaped path pass through North America, just a little bit to the west of where we are now. So this repetitiveness is because the predictability of what causes an eclipse is something that was well known all the way back to the ancients in terms of the predictability of it. And now we understand a lot about the way in which the orbits work. So to talk to you a little bit more about what is a solar eclipse, why they're so predictable, and why this particular one is so important, I'm now going to introduce you to Evelyn Liu, who's one of our Space Club executive, and Evelyn is going to share with us a little bit of knowledge that will help us on Monday to get the most out of our experience. So Evelyn, over to you. Yes, good evening, everyone. So my name is Evelyn, and I'll be sharing a bit about the eclipse and especially what we are going to be able to observe on Monday at John Abbott. And so, all right, so first of all, what is an eclipse? We, we mention a lot total solar eclipse, a solar eclipse. And so an eclipse is actually, oh, sorry. And so an eclipse is actually just um, the sun and the earth aligning perfectly with the moon in the middle. And so this is called a syzygy. And as you've seen probably, um, Canada Post did make a little stamp in honor of this event. Um, so we'll be able to see a little ad. All right, so if you do have the chance to go get some of those stamps, it'd be really cool as it is a special edition for the eclipse in 2024. And so there you go. So what is a total solar eclipse? As I've explained, it is when the moon aligns perfectly with the sun and the earth. Um, uh, and so it would, sorry, and so it would um, hide the sun with the moon. So on Earth, when we see it, we don't see the sun anymore. And so a total solar eclipse happens when the moon hides the sun in its entirety. So it will block out the sun with the central portion of the shadow, which is called the umbra. And the region that we can see it is a small region, but around it, we will still be able to see partial solar eclipses. Solar eclipses occur when the moon gets between the Earth and the sun, allowing the moon's long shadow to intersect the Earth. 
This is the April 8, 2024 total solar eclipse. The central part of the shadow, called the Umbra, sweeps across the surface at more than 1,500 miles an hour. It would move even faster if the Earth weren't also rotating in the same direction. The path of the Umbra is known as the path of totality. People in that path see the moon completely block the sun, turning the day into night and revealing the sun's outer atmosphere, the corona. The Umbra is over land for just an hour and 40 minutes before moving into the North Atlantic and then skipping off the edge of the Earth. So as most of you would know, the moon is very small compared to the sun. In fact, it is about 400 times smaller than the sun. And so how can the moon cover the sun in its entirety? Well, one way um, I found that was really helpful in explaining it is by putting your hand out and covering something that's far away. It can be a door, um, a painting, anything. And if you put it close enough to you, you'll see that your, your hand will cover the entire item but that doesn't mean that your hand is the same size as that item. And so because the moon is so small, but because it is actually 400 times closer to the earth than the sun, it will be able to cover the, the sun. And so if it is uh, covering the entirety of the sun, it is called a total solar eclipse. But if it is not close enough um, and leaves out just a bit, so the ring of fire, what we call it, it is called an annular solar eclipse. So there are actually different types of solar eclipses. And uh, as we know, the sun, well, the moon orbits around the Earth and the Earth orbits around the sun. So it, by that logic, we should be able to observe eclipses pretty often. Well, but we don't. And that is because the orbit of the moon is actually tilted in relation to the orbit of the Earth around the sun. And so when, it's, when the moon is orbiting around the Earth, its shadow will actually pass either above or below the sun. And so that is why we don't observe eclipses every single month. So despite not observing eclipses very frequent uh, every month, we do see them quite often. And the most recent one on March 24th um, of this year was a penumbral lunar eclipse. And so this eclipse is a bit different. It is not a solar eclipse, it is a lunar eclipse. And in this case, penumbral eclipse means that the moon was not in the umbra section, so the dark spot of the shadow, but rather in the lighter part. And so the brightness um, was not as visible. Well, the change in brightness was not as visible as a lunar eclipse, for example. But um, for people who are interested and had the equipment for it, you were still able to observe a little bit. And so, as I've mentioned before, there are a couple types of eclipses. So what we will be seeing is the total solar eclipse, where the moon is covering the sun in its entirety. Um, here in Montreal, we are lucky to see a total, but for example, in Toronto or even places um, outside in Western Canada, we, they will only be able to see a partial eclipse. So that means that the moon will cover the sun up to a certain percentage and then fade out. So they won't be able to see a total solar eclipse. And as mentioned again before, when the moon is further away and does not cover the entire sun, leaving a little um, ring of fire around, that is called an annular eclipse. And we were actually very lucky to see an annular eclipse back in October of this year from Montreal. And so the solar eclipse, the total eclipse is quite important because it is only during that time that we can see the sun's corona. So all the upper atmosphere, the activity on the earth, um, so we will be able to see that quite um, clearly as the rest of the sunlight is blocked off by the moon. And so here are a couple of pictures. And as you can see, the annular solar eclipse at sunrise, um, some pictures from John Abbott and uh, in the morning in 2021. And hopefully Toronto will be able to see that view. And so uh, where will you guys be on April 8th? Well, we are very lucky here in Montreal that we will be in the path of totality. So as seen previously in the video, um, the path of totality starts in the Pacific Ocean, moves on to Mexico, and then across the states from Western to Eastern Canada, up into uh, the Maritimes, the, and then it will move on to the North Atlantic Ocean before it skips off the earth. And so, we, here in 
Montreal, we will be right at the edge. So here's a little animation of the path of totality. So as you can see, the areas that have that are in the uh, path of totality will go dark as the sun is completely blocked off by the moon, so there will be no more light. And the um, places around it will get partial solar eclipses. And so it's moving up to Texas, I believe this, yes, Texas. So Texas, Arkansas, and then all the way up to the eastern part of the states, which we are approaching. And here we see the Great Lakes, and we will be approaching Quebec very soon. So as you can see, Toronto is right above the path of totality. And Montreal is right there, right at the edge of it. So we are very lucky this time to be able to observe it. And in fact, if you live in El Bazar or Laval, you won't be able to see a total solar eclipse, but you'll be really close. And then here it goes off to the Maritimes and into the Atlantic Ocean. All right, so as you can see here, a map of Quebec, we are in Montreal. So right at the edge, if you were in Sherbrooke or within um, the middle of the total eclipse, uh, the path of total totality, you'll be able to observe it longer. But because we are right at the edge, we will be only be able to see it for about a minute or so. Um, and as you can see, Sherbrooke, that's in the middle of the path, can observe it for just over three minutes. And this is just a little animation, once again, of what we can expect on the day of um, and how it will happen over the course of the afternoon, starting from about two. So at this point, this is still the partial eclipse, right? We see the moon slowly covering the sun at this point. You see the... Here's totality right about now. And as you can see, totality was very, very quick. So 70-ish seconds is goes by really fast. So if we do get the chance, if you do get the chance to go out and observe, it'd be really, really cool. And then after that, it fades out from the other side. And again, yeah. So um, if you are not in the region or if you're not in the West Island and you can't reach John Abbott, uh, there are a bunch of other observation sites across Montreal and across um, the entire country, uh, and you can find them on different websites such as eclipsequebec.ca. But if you are able to come to John Abbott, we will have some really fun activities in collaboration with the RASC Montreal Center, but also MDA, the McGill Mac campus, uh, Let's Talk Science, and uh, even a speaker from the Canadian Space Agency. So is this really once in a lifetime opportunity? Actually, a lot of people have asked me that because they've heard of eclipses happening before, but I'll give you some stats. So the last one that was, uh, the last total solar eclipse that was in Fredericton was in 932. So that's over a thousand years ago. And the last one that was over Montreal was in 1932. Um, and maybe some of you were there for that, but a lot of people weren't. And the next one that's gonna be in Atlantic Canada is 2079. And in Toronto, 2144, and in Quebec will be 2106. And that's pretty much past at least like my expiry date, maybe. Hopefully I'll be able to live long enough for that. But again, it is a very rare occasion to be able to observe it in our backyards here in Montreal. And so we keep talking about observing, but the most important part about observing is to never look up at the sun with your eyes directly. Even with sunglasses on, it is super, super dangerous to look at the sun directly and you should never look at the sun directly with your eyes, even if there weren't an eclipse. Um, it is it can be harmful and dangerous and lead to 
multiple uh, consequences. And so to observe safely, there are multiple ways. The main way being using an eclipse glasses or eclipse viewers. If you want to use a camera or a telescope, make sure you have solar filters or the appropriate equipment to be able to observe. And if you do want to buy eclipse glasses, um, they are giving them out at multiple uh, centers across, can uh, across Montreal. But if you do want to buy them yourself, make sure that they are ISO certified. And so on the edge of um, your glasses, it should have a number ISO 1231222 at 2015. And so should be certified because the, the filters block out most of the light at 99.997%. If it is not certified or it is not from a reputable distributor um, and it does not block out all, most of the light, it can become very dangerous for you to observe with those glasses. So make sure you get them from somewhere that is um, a well-known distributor and that is certified. But if you don't have access to glasses, you can make something called a pinhole viewer that um, using a shoebox or a, a cereal box, it is basically another way to observe. And instead of looking at the sun directly, you are observing its projection. And so as you can see, this lady uh, is observing through the shoebox and this, so she, her back is actually facing the sun and the sunlight is going through that little hole in the middle and projecting on the paper. And if you are lucky enough to come to Jack, we will have some pinhole um, rooms. So big rooms where you can physically go in and see the projection of the sun. And you can get very creative with that if you don't have a cereal box or if you don't have shoe boxes or anything, you can just use paper and two paper, poke a hole in one and use it as a projection. And if you're too lazy for that, uh, you can even get a cheese grater or a strainer or anything that has little holes in it because the sunlight will pass through the, the pinholes and project onto wherever you're pointing at. And if you look carefully during the partial eclipse, right before and after totality, if you're in an area uh, that are near trees, you can look on the ground and see crescent shadows. So those are reflections um, that happen naturally with the leaves as the leaves act like a pinhole and uh, they'll be able to project little crescent shadows. Shadows are in form of crescent um, on the floor and on the ground, and it is very, very cool. So yeah, you can get creative with the way you want to observe without glasses. You can draw, you can write out your name, you can write out the Eclipse 2024, anything. So you can see the picture on the bottom left here. They actually wrote out Eclipse 2017. And in 2017 here in Montreal, we had a partial eclipse. And so you can see the crescents. Those are the of the projection of the sun's shadow, of the sun. So there is actually a time where you can take off your glasses. That is very shocking, I know. But during totality, because the moon is covering the sun, you can take off your glasses and observe. But that is only during totality. So the second before totality, even if it's just a second, it's still a partial and there's still sunlight. And after that too, you have to put your glasses on. So during a partial, during the partial phase, glasses on or filters, whatever, pinhole projectors to observe, but during totality. So for 70 seconds, you can take off your glasses. And then after that, glasses back on until the eclipse is over. And even then, please don't look at the sun with your eyes. It is very dangerous. So if you wanna stay safe, you can put on your glasses throughout the entire event but make sure to put them on during the partial phases. So during the, uh, the afternoon, you'll be, able to to, you'll be able to observe a couple of things. So first of all, you'll see that the cumulus clouds over the land so that, that are closer to um, the land basically will begin to thin and you will be able to feel a drop in temperature that is about 10 degrees Fahrenheit. And I've never experienced it before, but I was told that since it gets darker and darker, animals um, will think it's gonna it's starting to be evening and then night. So birds will fall asleep, flowers close, and um, certain animals will make noises or act or get confused because they think it's the night. So hopefully, a Jack will be able to see some of that. And all of this happens within the span of two hours. But that doesn't mean you need to look up for the whole two hours because again at Jack we have a bunch of activities for you to do. Um, 
in collaboration with the RASC, with the Space Club, and with McGill Mac Campus. If you're not able to make it here at Jack, don't worry, there are a bunch of live streams and um, resources. So a live stream from timeanddate.com and NASA, they will be able to live stream the totality and the solar eclipse from across uh, Northern America and the RASC New Brunswick Center will be uh, uploading on their YouTube channel at Eclipse Up Close. And why should you try to see totality? Well, I mean, first of all, it's really cool that it gets very dark all of a sudden during the middle of the day. And if you can see the picture here on the left, that is during the partial eclipse in 2017 in the front oval at John Abbott. So that many people came out. And in the next video, you'll see a bit why and the hype behind the eclipse. So this was during 2017 total solar eclipse. So as you can see, it got very, very dark very quickly. And as you saw from the families that are sitting there, they were able to take off their glasses. But the second that um, it started, well, the darkness faded away, they put on their glasses. So I hope we get to experience that at Jack. Uh, here are a bunch of other resources for you. So if you want some Canadian content, there's Eclipse Quebec, as I've mentioned before, the RASC website. Uh, the Canadian Space Agency has a bunch of resources on their website for kids and for adults on how to observe. And then uh, Montmigantic uh, also has their um, resources on their websites. If you want information about the map, so to see if you'll be able to um, observe from your home, for example, you can go on timeanddate.com, eclipse2024.org, Great American Eclipse, and American Astronomical Society. Just uh, other resources for you. And that is all, thank you. That was amazing, Evelyn, thank you so much. I would like to say something, Kareem, if I could. Please. I really did enjoy your presentation. I really thought it was very interesting and very enlightening. However, I did find that you said one thing that I think requires clarification. You did mention that if you wanted to keep your glasses on for the entire thing, you could. And of course, while that's true, you can't. Uh, you must wear your glasses during the partial phases. Any of the sun itself is visible, glasses are on. But when the total part of the eclipse comes, all of the sun will be gone and then if you have your glasses still on, you won't see anything. You've got to take them off during the one minute or so of total eclipse. It sounds like just one minute, but that's the reason you're there, to see a total eclipse of the sun. And that's how you will see the total eclipse. As soon as the diamond ring comes a second time, the sun appears again, glasses go back on. But other than that, Evelyn, I thought your talk was, your lecture was wonderful. Thank you for brightening my mind about the coming eclipse. Thank you so much. Uh, well, we have a few questions coming in through the chat, and one of them was, uh, will you have glasses to distribute on site during the event? Yes, we will. So starting from 2 p.m., there will be multiple tables across campus at Jack. They'll be giving out glasses. And if you have uh, children or smaller kids, we will have a station where they can 
uh, take masks and make their own like superhero type masks with them um, and decorate it. So it's an activity for kids. So we will be giving out glasses until um, we run out basically. There's another question uh, from Petty asking, where is it in Jack? And uh, it will be in the oval in front of Herzberg building. Yes, so um, the event, the main event, so where all the tents and telescopes are gonna be, will be in the oval. So the patch of green grass right in front of the main entrance. However, we will have tables set up at multiple entrances, um, leaving the college, the building itself, and coming in from the bus station, uh, giving out the glasses. So um, we will have tents and we will have posters a bit around. And if you can't find them, feel free to ask anyone uh, or any volunteers or teachers that are there and they'll be able to redirect you. Excellent. And uh, the address and everything is on our website, raskmontreal.org. Um, one thing that I do want to mention is there were some couple of uh, requests to ask about photographing the eclipse and what to do if you want to take a photograph of the eclipse. One of the things that all of our volunteers will have is instead of just having eclipse glasses, which will be available for everybody on site to be able to use or share. We also have these Eclipse viewers and both the glasses as well as the viewers can be used on top of your cell phone cameras if you want to take pictures of the sun during the partial phases. We'll also have solar telescopes. So you can take pictures of the view through the solar telescopes or through the projection devices that we use with the solar telescopes. Um, but the other side of it is if you want to use photography, if you obtain solar filters for your camera, then you can take photographs of all of the partial phases, remove the solar filter to capture the full corona, and then put the solar filter back on for the exiting phases. This is something that some of our members do uh, and have been really expert in. One of the amazing composites that we've been using in our posters and that we also have available uh, in our RASC library as a donation was a print of the composite of the 2017 eclipse. And the images that you saw were actually created by David Schumann who, and uh, Paul Samard. And David is here tonight. David, can we, are you still here or did you have to, uh, David had to go. Okay, yeah, I was worried about that timing wise. Um, does any of the other members want to say anything additional about photography or did that capture most I, of it? I, I'm here. Oh, you are here. Excellent. I'm just trying to start the video, but it's not allowing me to. The Why host has stopped it. Did that work? I guess so. Yes, David, I can. We can see. Wonderful. You. Yeah, no, I never left. Good. Just packing some stuff. There you are. So uh, did you want to say a few things about photographing the eclipse safely? Yeah. Um, if you really want to try to photograph the eclipse, and I highly recommend it, um, you don't need very fancy equipment. But the one thing I recommend, and I learned uh, when I did it back in 2017, is if it's possible to bracket your photos. So there really is no perfect exposure for the eclipse. So it depends what you want to get out of it. So if you want more of the corona, you simply have to expose longer, let's say a second or half a second. If you want just the actual um, photosphere or the edge where you see all the pink and the uh, actual flares and uh, um, prominences coming off and with uh, the sun being very active recently, um, I'm sure there'll be a lot of that on Monday then you want very quick uh, um, exposures. In other words, um, some of the ones that I took were one four thousandths and one one thousandths of a second at 800 ISO with my Sony Alpha 6300 camera. So that's an APC uh, crop sensor camera. And this was through my uh, connected through my uh, William Optics telescope. And that's all the images that you got to see of totality. Um, and if you bracket, let's say I took brackets, three exposures at a time, uh, if you can try to take five exposures at a time. So it gives you more flexibility. The other thing is if your cell phone allows for it or your camera, try 
to film in RAW, take photos in RAW, because later on, there's more flexibility to process the image and tease out details from the corona like I did in my composites. Um, that composite was over 100 megabytes, um, 100, sorry, 100 megapixels just for that composite. So um, it's a lot of data, but I don't regret it. And so um, the other thing is um, many cell phones today are, are quite, quite good at getting these things. So to be honest, no matter what you do, even if you have a wide shot of the eclipse, you'll get to see possibly even the other stars that are visible, maybe a hint of the comet, which will be in the field of view. But the one thing I found amazing was around the whole eclipse itself, you could actually see around the horizon, a sunset 365 degrees all around you. And it was really bizarre. Uh, it's just the light as it happens, it, it's just strange as I can't even describe it. It's like a weird feeling. Um, so, um, so that's what you could do for photography. Um, don't be shy to push the ISO a little high so you can get details. Don't overdo it so you get too much noise. But um, you want to definitely bracket your exposures if you're going uh, to for the um, the uh, t totality part you know, for sure. For the um, partial phases, you have to use, of course, this, uh, just the way your eyes have to be safe. So does the camera, so you don't damage the um, sensor. But more than that, um, so you actually see the uh, crescent um, sun through through the filter. Because without it, it would be so bright that you can't see anything. And the reality was when I was going from my telescope from totality and uh, like the the end of the partial phase and contact. Um, contact two, like totality starting, you'll see that diamond ring effect. And there's a point where you have to take the filter off of the camera uh, to actually get totality. But there's kind of a gray area in between where it's so bright, even for your camera, but then so dim with the filter. Um, so you have to, uh, you know, like I said, bracket your exposures. Um, never, ever look through your telescope um, without those safety filters, um, you know, I mean, during totality, it's one thing, but it happens so fast. The diamond ring, it's like looking at a blowtorch in the sky. You'll know yourself when it's too bright, you know, you're just going to cover yourself. So um, just be careful when you're transitioning filters from your telescope or, um, you know, if you're using like a little, um, like small telescope, uh, Keep in mind, you don't need a very big and powerful telescope to get the uh, to get the the, um, the sun's details because it's so big, right? So even a small refractor uh, uh, with a camera connected to it um, would would be good. And um, you can even take videos of the whole event. Uh, like use your smartphone, take videos, and then just look at the eclipse uh, totality um, to actually soak it in yourself. And just put your your cell phone down somewhere or leave it steady um, and let it kind of film everything. So, um, are there any questions about photography or video? I have a question from Elise is asking: Is it okay to film the whole eclipse? Um, are we talking about the partial phases into totality and the yeah. other? Yeah, so yes, it is, but just like your eyes, you have to use those filters for the partial phases. So once the partial phases are over and eclipse totality begins, then you would take that filter off of your camera or telescope or telephoto lens. Um, a lot of modern telephoto lenses, 200, 300 millimeters, that's perfect. I mean, the, the disc of the sun will be a little small in your frame, but you get the whole corona. So keep in mind, you want that whole corona. Um, uh, uh, visible. So absolutely, uh, just make sure you have batteries and memory cards because make sure you have thousands. Uh, the last time I, well, the time I photographed the eclipse, I took about a thousand photographs um, because of those bracketed exposures. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Um, it adds up fast. So make sure your, your card is formatted, ready to go. Uh, one mistake that a friend of mine, which will name be named nameless, uh, a friend of mine accidentally photographed the eclipse on the wrong resolution. He put it by accident on the low mode 
So every photo came out in 640-480 pixels, which is like a thumbnail. So always make sure your camera's set to RAW and JPEG, if possible, if you're using a DLSR. And make sure that your, your chip is, is fully empty and ready to take hundreds of photographs. Because you can always erase them after, but you can never get the moments back, right? So yes, absolutely film the entire thing. But remember, you must use the filter. Um, now, uh, the camera filters, if you just pardon me for one second. I've got a chart, an exposure chart um, for cameras. If I could share my screen, people could maybe take a screenshot. Uh, please yeah, do, I, Carl. You can share your screen. Everybody can see that? Yes. Oh, fantastic. And I also put it up on uh, the RASC uh, Facebook page. The RASC Montreal has a Facebook page uh, as well as a Facebook group. Um, uh, I'll make sure it's on the page as well, not just on the group. Okay. This is really helpful. I know we've gone a little bit uh, into the photography side a little bit more. Uh, we'll just uh, let David finish and then we'll go ahead and uh, go back to overall discussions. So uh, for your telescope and or lens, um, I was able to pick up from, uh, let's say from Celestron. Uh, this is uh, essentially it's like eclipse glasses, but it's made to go over the lens of your telescope or telephoto lens. And it's just a paper uh, thing that you fold up that easily slips over uh, safely over your uh, lens or telescope. So um, if you're using a cell phone, the eclipse glasses themselves have enough um, of coverage to go over the lens of a, of a, a cell phone because the lenses are so tiny. So if you wanna try that for the partial phases with your cell phone, because many people don't have these big setups, um, that'll work. So, you know, um, that's what you could do. Um, are there any other questions about photography? And uh, uh, bracketing is key, I could tell you that. I, I want to add one thing just uh, for the everyday uh, amateur astronomer, space enthusiast, somebody just coming out to see what this eclipse is all about. One of the things that's been told to me is your first totality don't try to photograph everything. Don't try to photograph it. Your first totality, enjoy it, appreciate it, use the tools that others set out for you or use your own tools to the way you know how to use them that you've practiced using them. Don't try anything new or different because you'll miss the moments of totality. I could the tell you most important yeah. thing is catching those 75, 77 seconds, catching the Bailey's bead and diamond rings before and after being able to appreciate what it is that you're seeing because it goes by very quickly. And if that's you're buried I, behind a lens, yeah. yeah. That's what I wanted to add. When I was in South Carolina, um, the two and a half minutes that we had, I couldn't believe how ridiculously fast the whole thing was over uh, from diamond ring to diamond ring. I did take, while I was holding my remote control, I did take a look up just to make sure I could see it with my own eyes, the totality part. And and um, that was burned into my head. I'll never forget that. So do yourself a favor also. Take time to absorb it as well, like for yourself. But, now, um, you know, at the one, worst, one, leave your cell phone, like capturing it, like, you know, uh, point it up and, uh, and just record that way and then just enjoy it yourself uh, visually. Yeah. Uh, there was a question about where to set your focus to because it's not to infinity, right? Because... No. So in my case, um, because I have a more advanced uh, video system, I use something called focus peaking. Um, and so you, you have to focus um, during, um, before the eclipse starts, when you have the filter on, um, there's most likely going to be sunspots. So if you focus, focus on the edge of the disk where um, a lot of the um, interesting things will be visible, like the Bailey's beads and the corona itself. So if you if you have the edge of the disk in crisp focus, that's what you want to do. 
But if you have focus peaking on some of the more um, modern um, cameras, you can use that as you're focusing using, let's say, um, a, a focus peaking color like yellow, white, red, or green. Now, red wouldn't be the greatest because guess what? Uh, what you're trying to photograph is yellowish, uh, you know, most filters. So uh, that's one way. So use the edge of the disc um, before, to, uh, before the partial phases start when your filter's on the camera and try to get that edge as crispy as possible. And keep in mind when you're using zoom lenses, if you plan to, as you pointed up, many zoom lenses tend to slide down with gravity. So put a piece of uh, gaffer's tape or, or painter's tape to prevent that lens from accidentally sliding down while you're pointing your camera up. It's little details like that that make a difference for you. Um, and to keep it as steady as possible because any little vibrations or shakes will add blurriness to longer exposures, like for the corona. We have one more question about uh, photographing in the, from Stephen. And he asked, what color temperature for white balance should a DSLR be set at? I personally would recommend the daylight balance because that's what you're filming is daylight. Uh, if you film in raw, you can always change the color balance after the fact. It's easier to do that. But I, I would stick with daylight. I believe that's 5,600 Kelvin. And finally, there is a reminder from Santiago not to forget the shadow bands of uh, during solar eclipse as well. This is They're happening very, during totality. They're very elusive, though, uh, hard to see. Um, I know that Santiago tried to videotape um, the shadow bands, but it's very, very uh, fickle to see those. Um, but yeah, there's all kinds of things going on during the eclipse. And in South Carolina, we did notice the birds and animals and crickets. Um, it was absolutely, a, pardon the pun, a day and night difference. The other one thing before I, I let you go with this is that when we were there, it actually started drizzling rain a little and the sky was overcast. And as the shadow came closer towards us in South Carolina, all of a sudden the sky just evaporated. And apparently because it gets a few degrees cooler because of the shadow, um, it does affect the microclimate over viewers. And there is possibilities that if there are some lingering clouds in the sky, that they actually evaporate as the eclipse approaches. And it's almost like the sky parted ways for us to, to get a, a good look. So um, there is that to think about as well. But it's just an eerie feeling. And just a few minutes before totality is when you feel the sky is undescribable, like the, the um, because all the shadows are no longer being created by pinpoint light, right? So if you make little pinholes everywhere, um, you'll see little crescents everywhere, right? Projected by the, uh, the, the, uh, the sun that's being obscured. And it's just an eerie feeling um, of, of like a light. I can't describe it. Yeah, you'll see on Monday. Any other questions? Let's open it up as well for questions about the topics in the presentation or any questions or if anybody wants to share their own experiences with eclipses. I'm gonna actually get rid of all the spotlights and turn this into a gallery so we can all see each other. Thank, Thank you, you, David, for adding. And again, uh, Evelyn, that was amazing. Um, We'll do proper thank yous in a few moments, but let's go ahead and open it up and see uh, if people want to chat or add any questions or any thoughts. I just wanted to say thank you so much. It's been super informative, really great. Thank you so much. <coughs> thank you, Jen. Um, for for people that aren't too uh, agile with their cameras and that, and they just want to take cell phones. Also, we'll be projecting the sun on our little uh, projectors, so that that's that'll be easier to photograph as well. Um, in the opening poster, you had a picture, I think, from uh, Frank Thomas of his, his, the sun he showed on his projector, and that's easy to photograph with uh, any cell phone. So, yeah.
Yeah, see, see that? Yep. We'll have some of those available, so that's easy to take a picture of. Yeah, I got one right here in my hand. And just to brag a little bit, Nicole won the uh, astronomical uh, tinkering tool making uh, prize from CAFTA this year for that device. It's a solar funnel that takes the eyepiece and extends the view so you actually see it magnified onto that surface. We had a workshop back in uh, October before the October 14th partial eclipse where uh, we, a lot of us made these like the one Alexa is showing and uh, we're going to have those with us. Yeah, it's fun because then you get to share the view with several people instead of people lining up at the eyepiece, they can uh, share the view. Do you know how big the uh, Sham Obscura are going to be? The giant pinholes that you walk into? Eight foot by eight foot by eight foot. They're going to be nice and large and covered with blackout theater curtains from our theater department. There was um, a question in the chats about filters with an iPad or something. Um, yeah, you always have to use a filter, even for your camera during the partial phases, because even if your sensor doesn't get burned out, um, you're not going to see anything. This is going to be a big glare. All the way to the end where the diamond ring effect happens, it's even 1% of sliver of sunlight is so powerful that it'll absolutely flood out your camera, your picture. There'll be nothing to see. It'll just be like taking a picture of the sun in the day. It's literally just that totality that that, that, that fleeting moment happens where it's okay to take off the filter for the total uh, phases. So yes, without the filter, you, know, you might have a nice sensor or camera on the iPad, but it's not gonna photograph anything. It'll just be like a glare and you'll see nothing. On the other hand, it's not good for the sensor. It overloads the um, the sensor, you know, think about, well, I hate saying this, but when people used to take magnifying glasses to try to, you know, burn ants or burn things. So think about what's going on with the filters, uh, not the filters, but the lenses of a small telescope or even the camera lenses. Um, it's all to accumulate light. So the sunlight's extremely powerful. Keep in mind that when we're using these filters, one one millionth of the light is being reduced by these filters and UV and and, and um, infrared as well. So uh, yeah, definitely use the, the, the filters um, for the eclipse during the partial phases, even on your iPads and, and cell phones. And you'll get a nice white or orange, depending on the manufacturer, a tinge to, to your uh, crescent suns. Um, strange to say that, crescent suns. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure if it'll burn the sensor out. Depends on the uh, circuitry in the camera, but it's not good. Put it that way. Um, just the way your eyes wouldn't be too happy. Your retina would burn out. Um, you can overload the sensor if it's a CCD, especially. Although most modern cameras use um, CMOS sensors, which uh, behave differently. You don't want to overload them with sunlight, direct sunlight. Um, when, like, like normally in the daytime, you would never film the sun. It's the same thing here. One Without interesting special. thing I'll point out is uh, there's individuals who use their reflector telescopes, like the one that I have behind me, and instead of putting an eyepiece, they project it directly onto a piece of paper or something like that. Yeah. If the optics are not well made, like the one that I have behind me is a relatively cheap one. In one of the meetings that I was on earlier this week, we were talking with an astronomer who has been going to eclipses for a long time, and he decided to just pick up a refractor when he got off the plane at one of the last uh, eclipses that he went to, mm -hmm. and he set it up that way. And afterwards, when he looked at the lenses, the lenses had deformed by the amount of solar energy going into those plastic lenses, because they were plastic, not glass. And so yeah. it had actually deformed the lenses where the entire image, when he started looking at his photographs of the image, the image had distorted during the eclipse. 
So the amount of solar energy coming even just into a tiny spot is the reason why the filter always has to be the first thing that the sunlight comes into. And if I want to look through a telescope, I can't set up the telescope and then put on the eclipse glasses and look safely. I have to have a filter on the end of the telescope and then look through the eyepiece at the other side because you only ha can have that 0.003% of light coming through anything more than that and it's too much it's too much solar energy and keep in mind some um and this is we as astronomy community we're always upset about this um to the point where it should be outlawed but we don't control the market um the screw on sun filters on some cheaper refractors um especially the ones that give a green tint please throw those in the garbage smash them and throw them in the garbage do not use those they are cheap, and when the concentrated sunlight can pass through some of these refractors, they heat up those filters and they can crack and let sunlight right into your eye, which is magnified. So um, you'd, you'd be irreparably damaged. Um, there's, there's no cure. You can't go to the doctor and get a new cornea, um, you know, retina. It you know, doesn't work that way. So please, it's just not worth it. Don't use those cheap sun filters that come with these... Uh, smaller refractors um you know like Karim said the the light filter must be the first thing in the path of, of of the light coming in only then is it safe to get you know to the eyepiece yeah. so and just to oh, be clear sorry. this is not just for an eclipse this is anytime you look at the mm -hmm. sun the only reason why we're so much more careful with this messaging during an eclipse is because there's something weird happening in the sky. So your natural tendency, because we're humans, is going to be to look up towards the sun. And that's that's right. why we have to be extra careful with the messaging. But the sun is never safe to look at. The, the, the one thing that I've been hearing lately, and yes, there's a lot of weird stuff out there about the end of the world and this and that. Um, people, including some of my family members that I'm a little uh, irritated about, um, they should know better. No, the eclipse is not some weird magical thing that makes the sun different. Um, you know, I was asked, is it more dangerous? Do I pull my down my blinds? And I go, my God, no. I said, the sun is the sun. It's it's always there. And like Karim said, we normally don't look at the sun. There's no reason to. Um, it, it, it's, you know, you're doing this, right? When you're driving and it's really in your face, and even with the sunglasses, you know, you kind of hide yourself, right? Um, the only reason why an, an eclipse seems to be more dangerous, which it's not, is like Karim said, we have a curious reason to want to look. There, there's some kind of reason to look. But normally during our every days, when you go for a walk in the park or whatever, you're not staring at the sun ever. Even when there's a sunset, it's not a good thing. So, um, um, so that's why a lot of people say, oh, my God, an eclipse, uh, the sun's different or, you know, um, like we're going to melt or something. Uh, no, not at all. If if you're careful with the glasses and you enjoy totality, it's something that's a spectacle for life that you can share and enjoy and, and really cherish. And so we're very fortunate that um, Montreal's in, in most of Montreal's in the path of totality. Uh, it's an extremely rare occasion. Thank you very much, David, for your information. Um, I just want to go back to Nicole and ask, she wanted to say something. Uh... Um, yes, with the projection, uh, like Karim mentioned, um, even when you're using cheap telescopes and that, be careful because if you're projecting on a wall or something, make sure nobody uh, by mistake looks into the eyepiece. That's why I find what, we, what we're going to have at uh, John Abbott is much safer. Nobody can look through the eyepiece because it's it's wickedly powerful those beams of light um i want to i want to also add something to uh, to this is um we talked about the refractors and if the if the optics are are good uh, optics and and made of glass it's perfectly fine but um i want to also uh say that if you have a telescope with a secondary mirror even though the heat might not damage the mirror itself. It could loosen the adhesive of that mirror and it could go fall on your, your primary mirror. So 
using a telescope without a filter, you have to know exactly what you're doing and whether your telescope can handle it or not. So uh, a Newtonian or a, or a Dobsonian or any kind of telescope that has a secondary mirror might not be a very good idea. Yeah, very well uh, uh, said, Matter. Um, a really good point. Um, also, if you have, if you're fortunate uh, to have um, a Coronado or a Lunt dedicated solar telescope, those are perfect for the partial phases. Um, so, I mean, those are already designed for very safe viewing of the sun uh, with built-in specialized filters. Um, so, uh, but those are a little more unusual. I believe the center has our Coronado 70 millimeter, which I believe Santiago said will be um, available um, for the partial phases. Um, those filters cost thousands just because they're very specialized in, in how they treat light, allowing us to look at the um, prominences on the sun and the, uh, you know, the, um, at, um, you know, the, the surface of the sun, essentially, where you could see all these fantastic details in hydrogen alpha. So if you get one of those telescopes, uh, um, you know who you are. Um, you're lucky for the partial phases as well. There's a, a question that I may have missed from Joanne. Um, I think she's still here. She asked, could I buy T-shirts and pick them up on Friday? Um, is, is this question um, uh, for the center? So I had messaged her, uh, we don't have any more oh, left of the right, last okay. t-shirts, but uh, the John Abbott Space Club has designed t-shirts which students had the opportunity to purchase in advance. Um, and they will hopefully have a few extra available um, on the Oval. Is that the case, Evelyn? Yes, we ordered a couple only extras. So um, we don't have a lot of extra ones, but we will be only um, selling that we'll we will be selling them on the day of only because we um, are receiving them on Friday afternoon. But we will have total solar eclipse stickers from Rask Montreal. Those will be available for you to pick up at the event. The stickers are always cool. And um, the photo on the sticker is is real. It's not uh, it's not a graphic. So I know I took it. I think uh, we'll we'll give some formal thank yous and then we'll open it up for just some general discussion if anybody wants to hang around. But Nadir, can I pass it over to you? Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, uh, everybody, the, the moderators, the attendees, the members, uh, Evelyn, thank you very much for an amazing uh, presentation as well. And uh, as Karim said, it's it's an open discussion. Uh, we're we're a community of people who just love astronomy and everything space and outer space, and just join us to talk about anything within that context. <laughs>